Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So uh, it is sort of icy rain right now in Jackson. So we're having people walk very carefully across our now icy pavement. Um, hence the fact we're just catching our breath here for a moment. And those who chose Zoom probably chose quite wisely today. Welcome to Jackson Community Church. Whether you are here in person or whether you are in Zoom. First thing I just want to do is check, uh, were you able to hear the prelude well? Great. Thumbs up on all that. Good. And we always make any announcements for the life of the church and the community before we get started with worship. And one of our announcements this morning is a reminder that on Wednesday, uh, January 19th, 18th, 19th, we will be holding our annual meeting. We will be doing it over Zoom so that as many people as possible can participate and that given the current state of COVID numbers, we're just a little bit cautious and we don't put each other at more risk than is necessary. People that we're talking this morning about, you know, they were, they were trying to get out for dinner and several of our businesses around town are closed right now because of COVID incidents. So it's popping up all over the place. So we want to just be as safe as we can. So yes, there will be an annual meeting and yes, it will be on Zoom in a couple of weeks. We're also going to hold a membership class pretty soon. We're going to do that over Zoom on a midweek, about one week out, I think. And then we will welcome new members at the end of January. Uh, we have three or four people who would like to join us in church, which is lovely. So we'll be welcoming them at the end of the month. Other announcements for the life of the church or the community that I missed. Anybody have anything we need to add? All right, I don't see anybody raising their hand in Zoom, and nobody here is raising their hand. Okay, so, so speaking to the mic. Well, regarding our needs, the way station is in great, is in great need of non-perishable canned food. Um, or applesauce, the four packs, anything like that. Um, uh, instant oatmeal. These are all much needed items. So if you could help out with just one or two, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Sue. All right, then we're going to gather ourselves for worship together. And we're going to invite Alan to offer us some music to help us center ourselves. So please, whether you're at home or whether you're here in the sanctuary, this is your opportunity to really prepare yourself for worship. We ask that you place your feet on the floor if you're able. And maybe close your eyes, open your hands, and prepare to receive the gifts of the gathering today.
please join us in the call to worship. You will find it either on your screen if you are in Zoom, or you'll find it in your bulletin if you are here in the church. Like the priest Simeon and the prophet Anna waiting in your temple for the Messiah to arrive, we have also been your servants, O holy love yearning for the certainty of your promise sign. Today we also tell one of the stories about how the child grew up. He left his own family to walk out into the world and carry on his work. Yet the fulfillment of your promise came when, after he died, the Messiah overturned death itself to return to us, to be reunited with us. In this time between festivals, between hurt and healing, between help and hope, give us your peace according to your word. Your love moving among us reveals the shape of our innermost thoughts and illuminates the impact of our outward deeds. May we be guided by your light in the ways we love, and the ways we live. To set the tone for today's service, we're going to revisit one of the choir songs from the Advent season, Lullaby for the Holy Child, to remind us that the Christ child was born into the world and that the story we hear today is the first story that we have after we hear about him as an infant and a toddler. Hush, my dear, lies still.
we turn now to our prayers. We begin with the prayers that we share that are prayers of concern, and then we lift up together prayers of hope and joy and celebration. So beginning in Zoom, if there are any prayers that anyone wishes to raise up out loud, please unmute and go ahead and share those. The Zoom looks quiet. All right, then I'm going to turn to the congregation here in the church. And if you have a prayer you want to share, please raise your hand and Sue will walk with the microphone to you. Very dear old friend, a neighbor who's 91 years old, um, has been declining in health and his daughter was down with him this past week and she came down with COVID and she is sick as anything. So we're holding our breath that Hal will be okay. Their names, Hal Buckingham and Margie. Hal and Margie? Correct. Okay. So prayers for Hal and Margie, for healing, for dignity on the journey of this time in the life. And for all who are um, losing time, losing work, losing health to COVID, may we keep each other safe. Other prayers of concern here in the sanctuary, if you, if you do have one, raise your hand. And let me lift up those names that we continue to share every week. Scamp, Huntley, Sasha and her granddaughter, Mary, Richard, Alice and John, Jan and Barry, Anne, Arden and Ray. We add to this Ben, who is a staff person for one of our congregation members who is living with cancer and has a new baby. Um, his, his son, his child is, is born in November and he's a new father um, and he is apparently doing well and will be coming back to work. But we hold Ben and his family also in our prayers and our prayers encompass other parts of the world they continue to focus on places like colorado where the devastation from the fires is so terrible where people have chosen violence again we pray for the communities in georgia where the decisions around ahmed aubrey are bringing some type of resolution, but they raise up questions about our justice system and um, at least give us an example of when things have gone in the direction that they ought. We pray for our partner church, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe. We continue to hold the communities in Honduras in our prayers and all the different places where our own families, our friends live, work, play, learn, um, which become connected to us through those relationships. We pray for all the places that people represent in Zoom, coming here and joining us, but living in other parts of our own nation, Ohio, California, Oregon, Florida, wherever people are finding themselves and joining us, we are praying for each other and all the parts of the world that are connected by the choice to gather here this morning. And even when you can't be with us by the Holy Spirit and holy love. We invite you now to raise up any prayers of hope or joy or celebration that you might wish to share out loud. We're going to start again in Zoom. So if anybody in Zoom has something they want to celebrate, please feel free to unmute. 
People are quiet every which way you go today. How about here in the sanctuary? Is anybody happy about anything? We're all just kind of neutral. Al, <laughs> are, you, are you raising your hand because you're happy? Okay, Alan's happy about something, so we're going to let Alan kickstart our happiness. Um, I, I just want to share. Okay, all right. Um, that um, since uh, my band released um, that uh, first single, our uh, drummer was contacted by a drumstick manufacturer um, and is meeting with the CEO to get an endorsement to, to endorse the drumstick. So cool. it's really exciting for us. So the, totally band, didn't expect that. the band is going to endorse drumsticks. Yeah, cool. That's pretty cool. So <laughs> I, I drum company that's here, great. I, I, we didn't expect it, so I, I, we were very excited. So I Congratulations. Good news in another part of Alan's gifted musical life. Any other prayers of happiness? I don't want to miss anything. Well, prayers of happiness when we have snow, prayers of holding our breath when we um, have icy rain, and prayers for digging out and getting out to enjoy the snow, and snowshoeing, skiing, however it is, enjoy the weather wherever you are. Is there anybody that's in a warm climate that wants to raise their hand in Zoom and admit that you're actually cozy and comfy in a different way? <laughs> Colleen, Colleen's showing us that she's cozy and where she is. Well, please join me in prayer. Oh, holy God, today we consider the journeys that your son Jesus Christ took in his life. Last week we prayed about his flight to Egypt with his family. Today we will think about what it means when he goes on pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. And we ask that as we lift up these stories, we think also about how these stories reflect light into our own journeys, the lives that we are living the paths that we are choosing, the places we are going, and the places that we call home, and the people to whom we belong. We ask that you will be our guide and our light as we make these journeys as humans. And we ask that you will remind us that always we have a home here on this earth, but we have a home with you as well and that the great homecoming that will be at the end of every mortal life is to return to be joined in the light of holy love in your presence. And so there is a homecoming for all of us in our journeys. We ask that you will heal, offer dignity, hope, patience, resilience to those who need your presence, that you will inspire us and make us curious and creative and remind us to laugh and take pleasure in the simplest parts of our journey so that we don't miss it because where we are living, when we are living, who we are walking our path with right now, this is our journey. Let us cherish it. We offer you now our silence. And please join me as we pray together. And if you're in Zoom, please unmute so we can hear your voices raised up with those in the congregation here in the sanctuary. As we say together, our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. 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 Forgive We're going to sing verses two and three from Good Christians All Rejoice, which is an Advent song. You'll find it in your red hymnal in the pew, number 158. And if you're in Zoom, the words will be up on the screen. And we don't have a Bob, so I'm going to venture to try to be a song leader today. So I do not promise to be exactly on key, but I'll do my best. But please rise if you're here. may be seated. Uh, Jennifer asks that we will also add to the prayers that we raise up together. Um, prayers for her daughter Megan and friend who are leaving tomorrow to Dublin, Ireland for a week. Prayers for safe travel to and from home. That's an excellent prayer given the kind of journey prayers and the journey meditations we're making today. Jennifer, thank you. Who is my liturgist this morning? Ah, David is. Okay, so David, um, you probably don't want to get too close to those speakers. So if you want to stand at the beginning of the pew, right where you are, that's great. Pass. All right. Good. Luke 2, 41 through 52. The boy Jesus in the temple. Now every year his parents went to Jer Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be here in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. Thank you, David. I would ask that you would now pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning, as you know by now, is a meditation on journey. It's a focus through the lens of the story of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. Although in his tradition at the age of 12, he was considered old enough to study the law, 
the Hebrew scripture, to study, to debate Torah, to make decisions. And so he was considered mature enough to be independent of thought and choice, and he exercised it, as we hear in this story. Some people in this story think Jesus was lost, but Jesus retorted to them that he was exactly where he needed to be. He knew where he belonged. He had a sense of where he should be, what his purpose and mission was, who, what his identity was. And so it was his parents who were discombobulated. Not sure if everybody's aware, but of course, his family, along with many other people from his community, would have made that pilgrimage for the Feast of Passover from their hometown to Jerusalem. And they would have traveled together almost caravan style, and he would have had cousins and friends and many households that he would have been traveling with both ways. And so it wasn't uncommon for children to be in the company of other families, other households, and for parents to not see a child for a day. It's not surprising that when everybody packed up their things and headed home after this festival, walking or riding miles and miles from Jerusalem, the capital, back to their small village, that his parents might not have missed him right away. But when we think about this story and we think about the age of Jesus, one of the things we realize is that his parents still think of him as a young child. When they get nervous and they start looking for him and then they can't find him and they have to retrace their steps and go back to Jerusalem to locate him, his mom is almost chastising. Why wouldn't she, right? I mean, when you are panicked because somebody made you wait or you thought they were lost and they didn't show up at the right place, they didn't keep the date, the appointment, don't you get angry? Like one of my, the first things you do is get angry at the person that you were most worried about and you snap at them. How could you do this to me? I was so worried about you. My brain has exploded more times than I can tell you when I was worried about my children. Even occasionally my husband, when I, you know, we didn't meet up when I expected. I definitely have a temper. I'm not saying that Mary yelled at him, but her question is, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. But when he responds to them, he is not anxious. He's very calm. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? In his mind, he knew exactly where he should be. And he was surprised that they were treating him like a child who would be lost and that they didn't understand that he knew what he was doing and that they could trust him to make independent decisions, keep himself safe, be where he should be, and come home when it was the right time. Last week was Epiphany. Thursday was the day that they call the Day of the Three Kings, when the kings come to the infant Jesus. We know that Epiphany also means revelation. It means awareness. And that all those visitors coming to the nativity, coming to the family, were declaring again and again the holiness of the child that had been born in what we celebrate as the Christmas season. And then the holy child and his parents had to flee to Egypt because his life was being threatened by Herod. And he came back as a young child to his hometown to be raised among his friends, his cousins, those who lived his faith. And all those visitors were helping Mary and Joseph understand the importance of the child that they were raising. Angels, shepherds, wise ones. 
But what we're hearing today is that Jesus, for the first time in the scripture, declares himself that he has a holy purpose. He knows who he is, and he is actually, in a certain way, offering a revelation to himself, as well as to his parents and to those around him, that he indeed has a purpose in the world that is bigger than the one of being a dutiful son to his parents and remaining bound up in their smaller world in which they have raised him. He's already looking out the door beyond his home to what comes next. And when we pick up the stories again, it, we will be catapulted in time forward to the stories of a man who's about 30. We hear no more stories about Jesus from the age of 12 until he's an adult male going out into the world to begin his work. But here, right now, we have this really clear picture of one who knows who he is. And the question is, how do we take that kind of story and think about it in our own lives? Epiphany and even today, this kind of revelation are an excellent beginning for a new year when we're thinking ahead to what this year might mean for us and we make our resolutions or we ask big questions of ourselves and wonder what needs to change in our lives. We have chosen the theme of journey for the next several weeks as we approach Lent itself. And so we will be tracing not just the stories of Jesus's life, but looking at maps and thinking about where did he travel to whom did he choose to bring his work, his healing, his words? With whom did he choose to keep company? What happened along the way? He walked all those places. And so he knew the road very well. He knew the terrain intimately. And we will get to know it a little bit better too over the next several weeks. But today... We are in the presence of one who is just beginning to understand what lies ahead of him and what is possible for him. He knows where he belongs. And I think one of the big questions that this story offers for us today is, do we know where we belong? Sometimes we do. And maybe we know the address that we're attached to or the addresses that we're attached to. I have two of them. One in Ipswich and one up here. But sometimes, metaphorically at least, we're in that between place where we're not sure what comes next. We've left one part of our lives and we are making our way towards the next and we are in transition. And we're not quite sure where we belong, or even if we think we do know, we might be surprised. I want to acknowledge that again this weekend, with the decision that was made about Ahmed Aubrey's assailants, two of whom were sentenced to life in prison and one who will not see parole for 30 years. At the heart of that story is the question about where did he belong? Did he not have the right to jog through or run through or pass through the neighborhoods where he was going? Should he have been concerned that people would start chasing him and ultimately take his life? Who has a sense of entitlement that they do belong in their neighborhoods or their communities? And who walks afraid always when they leave their own door and steps out into the world? Last year, when we were watching the, uh, the 
biographical story of a family from New England who owned slave trading ships and who helped bank a lot of that trade. The couple that was hosting the movie, the gentleman, the husband, is a white man descended from the families that owned the, the ships and that helped finance the slave trade. And his wife is a woman of color. And she said last year, as we were having a conversation about that movie, that for the first time in her life, when she goes out to jog or walk in her own neighborhood, which is a really nice, safe, suburban neighborhood, she keeps her driver's license, her ID, visible through a plastic holder on her sleeve wrapped around her jogging attire so that if anybody questions who she is and whether she belongs in their neighborhood, she can point to her ID because she's afraid that even the gesture of reaching into a pocket for her driver's license could be considered enough of a threat that somebody might take her life in her own neighborhood. What does it mean to have assurance that you belong? And what does it mean to not ever feel that you're safe and that you truly belong? I thought I knew what I would be doing with my life and my ministry. I was sure I was going to be a hospice chaplain. My daughter died. I was comfortable working with families that were bereaved. I'd spent extraordinary amounts of time in cancer wards and then establishing a nonprofit that continued to work with those families. My work at Harvard in the graduate program was focused on conversations between chaplains, ministers, medical caregivers, and families who were facing a life-limiting illness or the imminent death of a member of their family. I was sure I was going to be a hospice chaplain. And then one summer, a little church in southern New Hampshire, in Dunbarton, invited me to come spend the summer being their minister while their own minister was on sabbatical. And that journey back and forth from Dunbarton to Massachusetts every week and the relationships that I made there, the experiences that I had along the way changed my path. I was sure I knew where I was going. I was sure I knew where I belonged. I, I was sure until I wasn't until Dunbarton, that parish experience, the work in the prison nearby, the work with families who had someone dying in a nursing home, the field trips to explore Buddhism and Christianity together, all the adventures that we had in that little church caused me to fall in love with parish ministry, with what it meant to be connected to people's lives across the beginning and the ending and every step of the way. And I couldn't see myself as a hospice chaplain anymore because I love church work so much that I changed the course of where I was headed. And here I am with you. And now I know that this is where I belong but I didn't know it for a long time. And not knowing, even when I thought I knew I was gonna be a hospice chaplain was a hard place to be. This morning at eight o'clock and then again, in our uh, faith formation class at 9.15, we put a labyrinth out and people took candles with lights and they stepped into the labyrinth, which is not a maze. It's not a place where you get stuck and you hit dead ends, but it's a series of winding. It's one path that winds in and on itself over and over again, and it turns and it turns and it turns, but it takes you into the center of the pattern. 
people carried their light, and when they carried their light, they carried also their questions. And once we were in the center, each of us, we placed our light down next to the light that was already there in the middle. We offered our prayer, our silence, our thoughts, our wonderings, our hopes in that central place. We left the light there and then made the winding way back out, out of the labyrinth. It's a short journey. It's a metaphor for the longer journey that we're all taking. But this is the time when we're invited to ask questions. It's okay if you're not quite sure where you belong right now. That's what journey is about. And it's possible that you'll end up in a place that you didn't expect, that other guides will come to meet you, that you'll have encounters with people or places along the way that will divert you from the path you thought you were on and turn you in a new direction. Today, as we enter into the journey of Christ and his life, and what his love means for us passed down through these 2,000 years. May we have the courage to ask big questions, deep questions, to be uncertain, to be unsure, to take a step bearing the light onto a path that will wind back and forth and surprise us by where it takes our eyes, our vision, our steps, our bodies, and our hearts. May we come to a place where we're not quite sure where we belong and we have the courage to ask, Oh, holy love, will you be my guide? Will you help me choose the path, the direction that I should be going? Will you help me find companions along the way? Will you let me be a source of love and light to others that I may meet on my journey? And will you help me, help me look into the hard places where people are struggling to find a sense of belonging, when things have to be changed so that those who deserve to belong like I feel as I belong now may also join us on this path and find the center and no holy connection because all of us believe that each of us deserves that holy connection. May we all arrive at a place where we have a sense of belonging, but may we have the courage to begin the journey, to continue the journey and go where the journey the way of Christ may take us. Thanks be to God. I want to share with you before we um, move into any other songs today, a series of images that the five o'clock group enjoyed and they felt was well worth sharing with you. One of the ways that we responsibly reflect on the child Christ as well as the man Christ is to understand that we are each made in his image and that he wears many faces across this world. And so I'm going to ask that we put up on the screen about 11 images of Christ as a young man in the temple. This first is a sculpture from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And the Christ that you see up on that uh, three dimensional relief looks a little bit younger than 12. To me, it looks more like he's three, but apparently he already knows what he's doing even at the age of three. And he's there in the temple and his mother has clearly found him and is accompanying him. When we come to the next image, we're looking at another cathedral. 
created by the architect Gaudí in Sagrada Familia. Uh, this was created 500 years later than the first image. And the parents of Christ are on a lower platform. You can see them. They're looking upward, and there's the boy in the middle among all the scholars raising his hand. He's making a point. He's in mid-speech talking to people, asking questions. And there are his parents. They look like they're pleading with him. How could you do this? You made us so nervous. And then I turn you with the next image to paintings. And we begin to look at the image of Christ across multiple cultures, ethnicities, languages, landscapes. This is an Italian portrayal of the boy Jesus from painted in 1308 by Duccio di Buonasegna. He looks very European, doesn't he? And then we'll look at, at the next image painted by Heinrich Hoffmann. This is a German image. This one's very familiar to many people. It's often used as an illustration of this story. And again, the boy Jesus looks quite European. He has very fair skin, dark eyes, brown hair, but he looks European, he looks Anglo, he looks white. I'm including the next image because it has a crazy story with it. This is the one that you found on the cover of your bulletins this morning. This is a Dutch painting of that story, but it is by an artist who, was, his name is Van Meegeren, and he was actually um, an accomplice with the Nazis, and he was on trial, and they were trying to retrieve stolen art. And he was testifying that some of the art that one of the Nazi generals actually had in his possession, which was being passed off as a Vermeer, was actually a forgery done by this artist, Van Meegeren. And to prove that he had forged that other piece of art, during the course of his trial, watched by people that were trying him, he created this piece of art to prove that he had the skill to forge a Vermeer and had done so and passed them off even to German generals as uh, classic valuable works of art. So what a complicated story for this version of that story. The next image that you'll see comes from Haiti. It was created in 1965 by a Haitian artist named Baptiste. And you can see the young child in a pink tunic. Could be a girl, could be a boy. And I believe that we see his worried parents outside the window in the, in the background. And then the scholars, men and women, wearing their shawls, holding the Torah all around him. He looks significantly different, though, does he not, from the European child that we saw in some of those earlier pieces of art. The next image shows the Christ child as he might appear. Oh, boy, we have unstable connection. We're going to hope we get to keep seeing the art. Um, as he might appear in India. He looks a little bit older. He's up close to the scholars. This is followed by an image that was created in Cameroon. And the young man that you'll see in the Cameroonian, I don't know if that's the right word, image is very different again from the original European child that we saw earlier on. Look at this young boy seated in the light of the doorway, his parents hurrying towards that place where he's sitting with his elders, asking them questions and talking to them. Mom has cargo on her head. 
they're both worried and they've been looking for him for days, but there he is and he looks quite calm and he looks like he's exactly where he should be. In the next image, it's an American image uh, actually representing Christ as a crow, native child among his elders. Mary and Joseph are in the top left corner looking worried, but there he is, a young boy, a native indigenous boy, speaking to the elders around him, astounding them with his questions and his answers. The next image is created by Hei Chi, who is a Chinese artist who has, um, is now a professor here in the United States and an artist here. And we're seeing Jesus portrayed in typical Chinese um, costume. And Hei Chi's style of art is also drawn from cultural references to both European and Chinese influences. You can see a lot of Picasso in there, I think, the Cubist influence, as well as uh, vernacular influences. And the final, the final image that I wanted to share with you, which is the one that the five o'clock group insisted that you all needed to see, is a British painting by William Holman Hunt who founded the Pre-Raphaelite movement. He painted this in 1860, and it, it, it represents an intersection between the old and the new. Look at Jesus in this painting, and it's hard to look away from him. He doesn't look wealthy, but he doesn't look like an angel either. He's not dressed in white with a halo around his head. His parents are lovingly close to him. He's turning away from those with whom he's been speaking. And he's looking right at us. And I'm not sure exactly what he's asking us, but there is something about the way he looks at us that challenges us to hold his gaze and be in relationship with him. I will acknowledge that this painting probably is deeply embedded with anti-Semitic aspects because it was a rejection of the Jewish religion in favor of the Christian religion. It was also a rejection of Catholicism by a Protestant that was trying to express his understanding of his faith. And so there was a lot of um, psychology going on in this image. Uh, people are having all kinds of different thoughts, but the symbolism is not always positive. And yet, he created something new when he painted this scene. And he was the one that helped me understand that in this story, Christ was making a statement that was the equivalent of an epiphany that he was saying who he was, that he knew where he belonged, and that we should pay attention and seek him as a guide. Thanks to the five o'clock group for inspiring this sharing of these images. We're going to, um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to mention the offering and we're going to pass over the doxology and go straight to Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We're going to sing one verse, verse three. And so I just remind all of you, whether you are in Zoom or whether you're gathered here, that we depend on your faithful giving. And so this is the time in the service when we simply remind you that your giving has made us a vital part of this community and this world. You can give through jxncc.org. You can place your donation in an envelope and leave it in the plate. And we will gratefully receive it.
We ask now that you'll stand if you're able for the final verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. sing the benediction together and we'll all go out into our slippery peaceful world <laughs> Go in peace.